Uh, I, I now have the pleasure to welcome Mark O to the conference. Mark is the Strategic Director of Beyond Zero Emissions and Independent Research and Advocacy Group. Mark is one of the only people in the country who is researching the scope of the unconventional gas industry and its impact on jobs in other industries such as manufacturing, tourism and education, which are all vital to our region. Mark, welcome.
or to provide, um, basically to provide, to provide heat in domestic um, houses or in industry. Now, it can be, that can be used in Australia um, or the gas can be exported overseas. To export that gas overseas, what you've got to do is um, refrigerate it to about minus 160 degrees and that turns it into a liquid and so it's, it's much more compressed and easy to transport and you can put it on the ship to take it overseas. Now the, there's a massive expansion in the gas industry that I'm about to explain in Australia which is primarily driven by, which is primarily for export. But there's also a big expansion of the amount of gas we're using in Australia because of the shift away from coal-fired power generation to, to gas as well. But it's important to understand in terms of the dynamics that um, that most of the gas, most, most of what's driving this expansion in Australia overall is for the export gas industry, the LN, and it's called liquefied natural gas. So, um, probably best if I answer questions later, but very, very quickly, it's mostly to Asia. The, the biggest export partner is Japan, and it's followed by Taiwan, um, Korea, and I think, I'm pretty sure China's after that. Uh, so Australia is currently the fifth largest LNG exporter in the world, but we're projected to be the largest overtaking Qatar in about um, 2020. So um, yeah, big future ahead for gas uh, if things keep going the way they're going. To, to explain the kind of scale of it, I've just taken one project, which is one of the four really big projects in Queensland, um, which is which is based around export, and that's the um, Gleeson LNG project. Now, that's just to give you an idea of the scale. Um, that's about parallel with Brisbane, down the bottom there. These are the gas fields. And going up the top there's about parallel with Gladstone. So about three to 400 kilometres and about 200 kilometres across. And that's just one series of, that's one of the smallest of the big four projects. So massive areas of land. Uh, and it's all piped up to Gladstone to be exported through Gladstone. So that's 30% um, Santos, which is an Australian-owned company, but most of, but the majority is by is by overseas owned by overseas owned companies. You can see there. So just to give you an idea, it's three big LNG processing plant trains in, in Gladstone. Um, there's going to be 2,650 wells in the first train. Uh, that's the first train only, but by the time you get to three, it will probably be up around 10,000, somewhere around 10,000. Um, it'll cover 24,000 odd square kilometres. Um, there'll be 450 compressor stations, uh, water huge water treatment facilities that Jeff was talking about. Um, you know, 20,000 kilometres of access roads, uh, 600 kilometres of water and gas pipes, and 430 kilometre major pipeline. So just that's just giving you a bit of a sense of how big these things are. Just showed the slide before. This is the Queensland Gas Company's field at um, near Tara in Queensland. And when you zoom in a bit, you see that um, you know there's a whole lot of infrastructure there. And just was talking about the pillar before, which is a beautiful piece of bush that I really love. That's going to be entirely covered. It's 8,000 hectares. Well, the the pillar of state forest will be entirely covered by a um, an industrial gas grid that looks a bit like that. By the time it's finished, as far as, as far as the eye can see. Um, and the water treatment facility is very large often. Uh, they often talk about the CSG camp, the We Want CSG campaign often um, talks about uh, you know, being the size of half a tennis court, but it kind of forgets about the, you know, the massive um, water treatment evaporation pond next to it. Um, you know, it's just a couple of pictures of the infrastructure. Just, that's another unlined pit where the production water seeps back into the water table. Um, and, and pipelines, you know, a massive um, infrastructure um, operations as well. And of course, then Curtis Island is where the um, where these big export facilities are being put in. And Curtis Island is actually a World Heritage um, area that's been excised. Um, and there's four there's four of these going on. Um, when they're finished, this is what they look like. And, and just to just to explain how it works, the um, these big things here are the LNG trains, and basically the gas it gets purified here. They take out a lot of the, um, the impurities, and then they run it through these pipes, which which freezes it to 
minus 160 degrees and stored and eventually put in a ship and, um, and exported offshore. So, yeah, that, that's the smallest of three massive projects in uh, Queensland, uh, four massive projects, three of which have been approved already. And that's the, that's the area in Queensland under gas exploration licences at the moment. Uh, New South Wales is, is a bit of a way behind, um, but uh, so that's probably where Queensland was maybe six or seven years ago. Um, and the most advanced project is the Narrabi gas project, which is going to have about 1,100 wells. Um, Gloucester's got about 100, Camden's got 80 at the moment, it's going to double soon. And mostly these are for around domestic, the domestic market, but of course pipelines are connecting us up to Queensland and there's the possibility of a, an export LNG terminal in, um, in Newcastle as well. And if that goes in, um, then it'll really open up New South Wales to that, to that massive export market that Queensland's gearing up for at the moment. This is the amount of land in um, New South Wales that's under gas exploration licences, so you know, absolutely vast areas. Um, I won't go on this, but just a, LNG is also natural gas, and basically it is conventional gas from, from um, WA and Northern Territory as well. And that's basically, that's all offshore gas. And so that's about the equivalent to the East Coast gas again. And um, so that's the other half of the LNG, of the liquefied natural gas equation. The only LNG plants operating in Australia at the moment that, that's exported are the Northwest Shelf and the, um, and, the and, uh, Darwin LNG in the Northern Territory. And they're about 20 million tonnes a year, so they're massive projects. Um, this is what we're getting by 2020. So that's all the projects stacked on top of each other. So uh, basically a, a five to six fold expansion of the, of the LNG industry. Um, I'm only just briefly mentioning coal because they're tied together. They're, it's part of the same thing, this massive expansion of, of, coal, and, of coal and gas exports. So, um, so <laughs> The, the gas industry is starting from a lowish base of 20 million tonnes a year and going ex expanding sixfold. The coal mines in Australia are going to expand, uh, are huge, and they're, going to they're, they're likely to expand, expand, expand several fold by 2020. So, this is port capacity in Australia, and um, you can see that it's going to, that they've, they're planning to expand it to about four times the current port capacity. So it's a huge, huge amount of coal that's been dug up, shipped overseas and, uh, and burnt overseas. Um, and the Galilee, the Galilee Basin is the absolutely most massive. Um, you know, the biggest coal mine in Australia is about 15 million tonnes a year at the moment, I think. And you can see that the, 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 the mega mines being built up there are just, uh, are just extraordinary. And if you're concerned about climate change, not everybody is, I, I certainly am. That's, that's quite a uh, terrifying prospect, but it's all part of this massive kind of industrial, industrialisation and, and expansion of fossil fuel extraction in Australia. I better ask, I better um, uh, maybe answer questions later, it's a, it's a good question, but I'll just try and get through this at the moment. So obviously, as we've heard, there's, you know, no one will deny that there's a lot of um, damage and negative impacts from coal and gas extraction. So the question is, um, you know, if, if you've got all these in impacts, there must be good reasons for doing it. The, the main justifications are basically, one, that it's necessary, there's no other alternative energy source. Um, two, that there's economic benefits, and that's probably the big one, that basically revolves around export income, providing jobs, and paying taxes and royalties. And the last one, in the case of gas, is that it's cleaner than coal. So, just dealing with the necessity one first, um, renewable energy can absolutely um, supply all of our energy needs and it's, and it's booming worldwide. Last year, um, investment in renewable over renewables overtook fossil fuels for the first time ever globally. Um, solar PV has come down to one tenth of the cost it was 10 years ago and reduced 20, uh, sorry, 40 percent, almost 40 percent last year alone. Germany, over the Christmas break last year in December, 
um, while we're kind of on our Christmas holidays, the Germans installed twice the amount of solar PV that we've got in Australia total. Yeah, so it's um, so it's, it's really booming and it's coming down to actually be uh, to reach grid parity with um, with fossil with uh, with gas. Sorry, grid parity with electricity pretty soon. Wind has. Uh, in pre has expanded by about 30 percent every year for the last 15 years, which is phenomenal. And uh, China, Denmark, and Germany in particular are uh, investing massively in wind. And, and remember, Germany is the powerhouse economy of Europe, and so you know these kind of countries that are really powering ahead are investing in a huge amount of renewable energy. Um, solar thermal is the other one. Um, solar thermal power is uh, is an important one because. It's different to PV, it doesn't produce electricity directly. What it does is, is uses mirrors to concentrate the sun's energy to provide heat. And the reason that's important is you can't store electricity very easily from solar panels unless you've got you know, a huge amount of batteries. But with solar thermal, it produces heat, so you can store the heat and dispatch it at any time of the day. This is a, a recent... Um, a recent solar power plant that's been built in Spain. It's quite small, this one, it's only about 20 megawatts, but it's a really, it's probably the direction we're going to go in the future. And just to explain very quickly how it works, um, the tower is surrounded by a field of mirrors. The mirrors concentrate the heat's energy onto a receiver at the top of the tower. At the bottom of the tower, you've got a couple of tanks full of liquid molten salt. During the day when the sun shines, the salt gets pumped up the top of the tower heats it to about 600 degrees and comes down and they store it in a, in a hot tank and that tank's like a big thermos and whenever you need electricity you just dispatch um, a bit of that heat and it goes and drives a, um, a, a conventional coal turbine generator and sends power out to the grid. So they've got dispatchable power that you can dispatch 24 hours a day, um, which is important in, in grids. Um, it's just we took Roscoe and Tony with her over there recently, uh, and they're building much larger ones in, in the US at the moment. I'll just skip on to I've got very little time left, I'm running a bit behind. Um, basically, it, look, this just shows that, um, get, okay, all right. So, one of the big arguments around renewable energy is yeah, all right, it can you know, it can do the job, it's too expensive. Um, the Key thing with um, so you've got to look at what's going to happen. You know, you've got the alternative. There's there's gas um, because there's a, the, the the default position is to just build a whole lot of gas plants rather than renewable energy. That's the direction we're going in Australia, um, unlike Germany, where they're going much more for renewables. And essentially, when once we start exporting those massive amounts of LNG over the next few years from Gladstone and other parts of Australia. Our gas, domestic gas price is going to be linked to global gas prices. And uh, because if you're Origin Energy or AGL, you don't want to sell gas domestically for a fraction of the price you can sell it for overseas. And these are global gas prices. We're linked in with the global gas market. And back in 2008, um, the, the, global, the gas price there was about $12 a gigawatt. And at the moment, it's about 3 or 4 in Australia. So if we build a whole lot of gas plants, we're going to have a massive increase in, um, in electricity prices um, you know, at some point in the future. At the same time, renewable energy prices are coming down because the more you build, the more the price comes down, as I was explaining before. And of course, there's energy security. Um, in 2008, the Grand Island gas plant in, uh, in, South, in WA exploded wiped out 30% of the state's gas supply for three months and cost the economy $6.5 billion. Uh, is gas clean energy? I'm going to really um, go through this very quickly, but the, the, the claims by the gas industry that gas is 70% less emissions than coal are basically based on comparing the worst possible get coal, coal plant with the theoretically most efficient possible gas plant. So comparing that and that, but the actual comparison is much closer to the centre. Um, the uh, emissions accounting in Australia is based on American studies that were, out, that were done in the 1990s and have been very much um, superseded by other research, but we're still relying on those, those outdated studies. And um, even though the US EPA, which did the original studies, has, has updated those studies, um, when 
in the US where they have measured the amount of um, fugitive emissions that we're getting is just saying it's a very important issue. They were finding, you know, 15% of, of well yield um, in, in places like Wyoming. In Australia, these massive projects have been assumed, have been approved, assuming about 0.1% emissions. So that they're basing those on those old US assumptions. And the other thing to really remember that's really important the APIA have acknowledged this that when we export gas overseas, it's not going to replace coal plants, it's going to actually displace renewable energy. Um, and of course, if you build gas plants now, it locks them in for 50 years. Okay, very quickly, just getting on to the economic benefits. Uh, the, the economic benefits. Um, we do export a huge amount of, um, of minerals in Australia, and that makes up a very large chunk of our export industry. The concern is, so there's definitely, you know, some economic benefits in, in making a lot of money from exporting minerals, but the concern is that what it does is has a hollowing out effect on the rest of the economy. So when you export, when, when you have this massive resource boom, um, you know, you get $500 billion coming into the country to build all this fossil fuel infrastructure and this mining infrastructure. The dollar goes up, and it's gone up like about 30% in the last few years, and that makes our goods, other goods that we export overseas, particularly manufacturing, education, tourism, agriculture, 40% more expensive. So they find it much harder to compete. And that's what's happened with Blue Scope. So, the, you know, the job losses in the steel industry, the automotive industry and other industries recently, are as a direct result in, you know, very large part of the, of the resource boom. You can see this graph shows that for, for the, the expansion of the resource boom has led to an equivalent contraction in the rest of the economy. And that's what's called um, restructuring, okay? So that's, so the resource boom is causing that to happen. Um, foreign company, the, uh, the gas industry is about eight, over 80% 8 foreign owned in Australia. So the, when the Japanese gas buyer sends the check to the, um, you know, to the American gas producer operating in Australia, it's counted as Australian GDP, but most of it doesn't reach our shores, okay, because it goes straight into that bank account. Uh, the entire mining industry employs less than 2% of the Australian economy. Not many people realise that. Uh, about 200,000 people. The gas industry employs, I think it's a, a, a bit under 40,000 people. Manufacturing, for instance, employs about a million and tourism about half a million. So we're, we're losing jobs in these massive sectors and not gaining the jobs in mining because it's so capital intensive and not labour intensive. Um, taxes and royalties, the mining industry pays a far lower corporate tax rate than um, other industries on average in Australia. Uh, they say, well, what about royalties? Now, royalties are a payment for raw materials. Okay, so of course you pay for your raw, raw materials. And I'll just point out that the CSG industry, I, I'm pretty sure in New South Wales, has a five-year royalty holiday um, at the moment. That may have changed, but I'm pretty sure that's the case to this point. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of question marks over the perceived benefits of the, um, the coal and gas expansion in Australia. It's very massive, it's going to, it's going to affect all, so many parts of our lives. And um, I think so, there's just really, there's a really serious debate we have to have in Australia about whether we want to go that way as a nation. Um, so, I'd just like to thank you all for um, your patience. Thank you very much.